Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome to Restore Online, and welcome to Super Bowl Sunday. So very grateful that you've decided to join us wherever you happen to be today. Maybe you're right here in the Kansas City metro area. Maybe you're in St. Louis uh, worshiping with us, or in Washington, D.C., or you might just be so lucky that today you're in Las Vegas, and that you are getting a chance to, to worship with your church family, with Restore, before the big game. Now, I know it's going to be an exciting day for all of Chiefs Kingdom, wherever you happen to be. But let me ask, what do you really, really want to have? What's something that tangible you just desperately need, that you desperately want? Now, now, for some of you, I mean, your first answer right off the top of your head is, I want a Chiefs victory. I want to win the Super Bowl again. For others, well, it might be something even more important or even more impressive than that. Now, let me ask, what would you do to have it? How long could you wait for it? How much would you spend? Well, here we are, and we're continuing our series through Jesus' most famous sermon, known as the Sermon on the Mount, and it's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. And here Jesus speaks in these unfiltered ways, and he drives home world-changing principles for our lives, all right, and for others. And today, we're going to dive into some powerful words about money and stuff. Our passage comes from Matthew chapter 6, so let's start at verse 19. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moss and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moths and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is a lamp to the body, and if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You know, if we look back to the first half of Matthew chapter 6, here's what we see. We see Jesus describing to Christ followers about our private life, about uh, our giving in private, about our praying in private, about our fasting. But here we have kind of in this second half of Matthew chapter 6, he talks about our public life, questions about how you and I, we relate with money and possessions and food and drink and clothing and ambition. And Jesus made it clear that you can't serve God and anything else. See, he's challenging us, his audience, to evaluate the use of our time, our talents, our treasure. And he's challenging us to uncover what's truly on the throne of our lives, to discover what idols may be lurking in our souls. You see, here when Jesus is talking about treasures, we learn that it's more that he's talking about action. That treasures are actually the action of generosity more than it is what we accumulate, the money and possessions that we have. And Jesus is letting us know that you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. So let me ask you, what makes a person rich? Well, just imagine. Imagine you got a distant cousin who contacts you, and he invites you to come to his house as soon as possible. And when you arrive, he explains that, well... It's time that he put his affairs in order. And he explained he doesn't have any children or any other relatives, so he decided to leave everything, his entire fortune, to you. Every bit of it. And you can hardly believe what you're hearing. And you believe mentally planning what debts you could pay off, what, what gifts you can give, what vacations you might take, and how you might invest this money for your future. Well, then he leads you down into his basement, and he tells you that he has been saving for decades. Then he opens the door, and he proudly proclaims, it's all yours. You can't believe your eyes. Milk cartons, newspapers, plastic bags, coffee containers, stacked almost to the ceiling. You inherited a basement full of things your cousin thought could be useful one day. 
Even though a man may have a truckload of it, trash, well, it's still trash. Amassing worthless goods, it doesn't convert them into something of value. And we have to ask ourselves, what is truly valuable? What makes a man or person rich? A worldly person counts himself rich when they've stored up money and stocks and properties and businesses. Just as a child collects marbles and rocks and bugs and toys because they think these things, right, suit their maturity. They suit their childish desires. But a follower of Jesus counts himself rich not by how much we accumulate, but how we use every resource that we've been given in generous ways on behalf of others. You know, in Matthew 6, here's what we find. Jesus taught his followers to use an accurate scale to weigh the value of things. He called his disciples to understand and recognize that those treasures found here on earth are susceptible. They're susceptible to decay, to moss and rust. And as Christ followers, we get to analyze our storehouses to determine their true worth. In other words, does your life and what we're laboring toward really matter? Does it have eternal value? Well, as we continue into these unfiltered words of Jesus, it can help us that if we look at the audience that Jesus is speaking to. Now, first and foremost, he's speaking to his followers, those that love him, those that trust him. And he's encouraging them to remember that their future hope, that their transformed life, it comes only, only through the redemptive power of him, of Jesus. Now, for the others who are listening, but they're not yet trusting in Christ, this entire sermon is really designed to kind of act as a mirror, to see how we are incapable of our own to be able to accomplish the life that we desire and that we are desperate in need of a Savior. When these seven verses, Jesus uses three specific examples to make his point. He talks about the treasure, the eye, and the servant. Now, quick sidebar. Jesus speaking about treasure here is just one of many references in which he makes to money and possessions. As a matter of fact, if, if you analyze all of Jesus' teaching, you're going to find out about 15% of everything that he teaches relates to this topic. It's more than his teaching on heaven. It's more than his teaching on hell. And it's more than those things combined. So, so why did Jesus put such emphasis on money and possessions? Because he knew there is a fundamental connection between our spiritual lives and how we think about and handle money. Now, we could try to divorce these, our faith and our finances, but God, he says, no, 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 they are inseparable. So let's talk about treasure. In his first section, Jesus contracts to, contrasts two kinds of treasure with two commands. The first command and the second command are really the positive and negative of the same, right? In verse 19, he, we read, don't store up. And then in verse 20, it says, but store up. And this is a command about our actions more than our bank accounts. As Christ followers, we're called to, to live generous lives with the fullness of our resources, our time, our talents, our money. Now, we could never earn or buy our favor with God or our salvation, but because of Jesus, we're, we're transformed. As Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, that, that we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. And Jesus here is reminded us that you can't take it with you. But through these generous acts of leveraging our time, our talents, our treasures, that we can send it on ahead. Jesus commands his followers to labor for treasure. Not treasure measured by income or net worth or possession. But the kind of treasure that gets stored up in heaven, where neither moth nor rust can destroy. And this treasure requires an action on our part a life of open-handed generosity toward others and toward the Jesus mission. And here we have Jesus' audience. They, they weren't wealthy. I mean, they were an occupied, oppressed, highly taxed group. Yet Jesus knew. He knew like he was talking to us that we would be drawn to the temporal, to the here and now, drawn to the stuff that I would think, well, it's mine. And he wants so much more for us in this life. 
So let me just pause for a moment. Let me just ask. Are you storing up treasure in heaven? Or are you investing more of your energy in treasure here on earth? And then we'll ask, what changes do you need to make concerning your generosity? Okay. The next image Jesus uses is called the eye. Now, it's interesting. In this section, we, we find this, what, what can be confusing to us with regard to this teaching of Jesus. Now, I had to kind of really dive in to understand this more, because this teaching, well, it's grounded in cultural idioms that, that are not really clear to us today. You, you see, but if you looked in ancient Israel, the idea of having a healthy eye was a reference to someone who was generous. A person who was generous was not stingy, but was full of light. The person who hoarded his goods and was unwilling to share talked about them being full of darkness. And when we store up treasures in heaven, well, we aren't looking at holding tightly to the treasures of this world. And when we begin to live this out, we, we indeed have this different set of eyes. We're going to begin to see both what we have and the needs around us. And we're going to be motivated to share more with those in needs because we're not fretting about what we have in here and now because we see things not on the temporal level, but the eternal level. Okay, again, let me ask. Would you consider yourself a generous person? If you ask some friends some family members, who do they view you as being a joyful giver, or are you more of a worried keeper? All right, Jesus' kind of last uh, focus here was about the servant. And Jesus finally goes right to the heart of the message of this passage by pointing out the real potential for money and possessions to become idol worship. And people can only serve one master. And it's only fitting for Christians to serve God as their master. Je Jesus names the thing that this whole section kind of centers around, and that is money. Now, he's not been attempting to, to hide this particular intention. The meaning of the word would have been very clear to the ancient Israelites that were hearing his words the first time. But just in case there was any doubt, anybody who was still confused on what he was saying, Jesus goes straight to it. He says, you can't serve God or money. You can't serve them both. You got to pick. My friends, Christ followers can't serve both God and money because we're going to hate the one and love the other. We'll despise one, all right, and be devoted to the other. The truth is, our human heart isn't designed or able to worship two distinct directions at the same time. The worship that God demands is characterized by our wholehearted devotion. I love how the Apostle Paul coached his pastoral intern, Timothy, about this. And he wrote about, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Now, now money isn't inherently evil. Money's a product. It's a product of culture and society, and it can be used for so many kingdom and dancing purposes. Money also serves kind of to, to root out the, the facts about our own heart. And in these verses, Jesus makes it clear that there's a proper place for money, and it is not on the throne of my heart or yours. He's telling us that Christians, we should see money as belonging to God, that everything I have is God's, that you and I, we're simply stewards of it. And so it is really his money that we're stewarding, and so we can't even see it as our own, as idols. And if it belongs to God, we get to give it and use it according to his purposes, according to his will. The human soul wasn't crafted to cling to money. It wasn't crafted to cling to anything other than God. We are created in the image of God to worship God. And so anytime when we allow something else on that throne, it begins to erode our soul. You see, the, the human soul, it's meant to adore, to praise, to exalt, to rejoice, to cling to, to trust in. 
this living God in Christ and nothing else. And when our affections and our devotion are fully oriented to God, then all of the issue of lives fall into place. One thing is for certain, we cannot serve both God and money. Okay, one more time. Has there ever been a time in your life when money became an idol? And if it has, and you've come past it, what did it take for you to move that idol off the throne, to smash that idol? You know, Jesus knew the answer to the question, how much money is enough? And the answer that we tend to answer with is always just a little more. And when it becomes our focus, well, then Jesus won't be. And when we ask ourselves how much of Jesus is enough, the answer is always all of him. And that's free and readily available. So if storing our treasure in heaven is an action, well then, how do you and I grow in our generosity? Let me just share kind of just, I think, a really two practical ways that you and I can lean in to grow in our storing up treasures in heaven, in our generosity. And the first thing's here. Give here at Restore to the mission of Jesus. I just want to say, your generosity creates pathways for kids and students to fall in love with Jesus. It creates streams where families can flourish and overcome incredible obstacles. It creates opportunity for young adults and single adults and sing senior adults to live lives of purpose that transcend the here and now to impact lives and eternities. I mean, just last week, we had six people baptized. And we had people in the water either being baptized or baptizing somebody else from age 7 to age 59. We had mothers and sons and daughters and girlfriends and Kid City and restored youth leaders baptizing and being baptized. And I'll tell you, if you have generously given to this mission, you have created those type of results. Now, here's my encouragement to you. If you give occasionally... Let me challenge you to give regularly. If you give regularly, let me encourage you to give a percentage of your income. Now, the Bible talks about the tithe a lot. And the reason I think it does is for two reasons. Number one, if you and I give a tithe, okay, 10%, well, it's a significant amount. It's going to force us to kind of wrestle through, is this money an idol? Do I view it as God or mine? And then the second thing is this. It's easy to calculate. You and I can easily figure out what 10% looks like. So maybe it's time for you to take a step in that direction. Now, I want to say to those of you who do tithe, thank you. Thank you. But maybe for you, it's time to stretch yourself to see what sacrificial giving might look like. As I look back on how God has used the generosity of us here at Restore, I am humbled and I'm astonished. But I truly believe he wants to accomplish so much more in the future. So that's one step. Give to the Jesus mission here at Restore. But the second thing I know that we're called to do, and Theo talked about this so powerfully last week, is this. Give to those in need around you. Now, now, Theo talked last week about our partnership with Care Portal as a way to connect with real needs right in our local community. Well, I just want to say, we got an easy way, again, for you to sign up if you're not a part of this. Because sometimes for us, we say, well, I want to give the needs, I just don't know. Well, Care Portal partners with our local schools, our local social workers to help families and individuals in need take steps forward to financial health and financial freedom. So I want you to do Right now, I'm going to put two QR codes on the screen. You can take a picture of both of them or either one. 
Because what you'll notice, one of those QR codes is for our Parco location, one of those QR codes is for our Waldo location. If you happen to be in the KC metro area, whichever you might be closest to, you can scan or take a picture of that code. If you're beyond that, take a picture of either one, and you still will get a chance to hear about the needs that are here within our local context, and that you can actually step in and financially help. I'll tell you. We have an opportunity to live this generous life, open-handed, to make an impact in the lives of real people right here, right now. And if you do, you will not regret it. These words written by the prophet Malachi have consistently been powerful, challenging, and encouraging me when it comes to my generosity. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough. Not be room enough to store it and everything. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful, so very grateful that everything we have, we understand is your words, that God, you call us to be stewards. And so Lord, I just pray that you would give us the insight and the wisdom, the challenge to go from closed-fisted to open-handed with our resources. God, that you allow us to practice this action of treasures in generosity both to your mission here, your mission abroad, but also to those in need all around us. And God, when you use us in significant ways to impact the, the need now, but even as we get a chance to witness, to see people say yes to you, to have people find salvation through your son Jesus, we know that we just play a part and the work is fully done by you. And we thank you for that free gift of salvation and that you call us to be a part of it. So we give all of this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.